and here he is, our man Hungerford, in his remarkable armour. Quite the character, well worthy of a look. I'm not going to try to interpret the effigy, I have no idea what cherubs and dogs and feet positions and all these things mean, if indeed they mean anything. The plan of this video really is so you can get a nice moving shot of the effigy as best as I can manage. And here the witterings of an armourer looking at it and seeing what it all means to him. I'll get some wrong I'm sure. I'll get some right. And somewhere in the middle will be what's useful I suppose. So I'll go around the other side just do a long film like this and then we'll uh, start at the bottom and whip our way up to the top see where we end up so here's his left hand side fairly similar to his right lost his feet annoyingly So to take a look at his armour and what springs to mind as I look at it now, obviously his sabaton had been mullered. He's missing his feet, no idea why. Just about to see the lames of some sabs there. A bit in a bad state of uh, preservation. His spurs. Now all through this effigy there's wonderful details. Little bits and pieces that can easily be missed. The, the part I find interesting about him, from just from my perspective, is he's got this little lobe over the ankle, and with all of this detail, a single hinge on this outside edge of the decoration at all. Now he's got a little capture point just there on the demi groove. If you take a look out on the other side, and you can see the lug that turned um, to capture the groove to the demi. But I don't know if I can see. There's a hinge look on the inside of his greaves. So his hinges are on the inside and there's no straps on the outside here. So he probably had pressel studs that lock the greave shut tight. The ankle here with that low, once you get past it, all it does is it wants to pull, it wants to pull the greave closed. So a wonderful piece of engineering that they managed to do there. We'll make our way up. Just deal with everything south of the polyune for a while. You can see just here that's a hole, a rectangular hole that's in the demi greave where there's a turn, a little T bar, which is then turned from that position to that position and it locks the demi and the greave together. I'll show you what I mean from the other side. So, this is the other leg. Slightly more damaged, but you can see the remains of the T bar just there that would have been on the greave. Demi is placed over the top, and then that bar is moved through 90 degrees and locks the two together. Amazing piece of engineering. Very sleek armour this man was wearing. Hinges on the inside, no straps on the outside. Fantastic piece of engineering for its time. Heavily decorated Demi. When you go on the website, it talks about him being in a Milanese harness, but I mean, it might have been where it was manufactured, I honestly don't know. I've not checked the history to that level on him. But it's a very typical, well, some elements are very typical of English harness, and I would utterly recommend Toby Capwell's book on the English knight from this period. It's a real eye-opener to the fashion and style that existed. Generally in the past, if you see flutes, they go, oh, it's Gothic, if it was smooth, oh, it's Milanese. But there was a wonderful English tradition, I would recommend Toby's book. Absolutely no problem at all. Now, we'll take a look at the poly. I shall probably prove myself wrong now, but all of this uh, fancy work on the side of the poly is different from one side to the other with regards to where the um, flutes taper in and out and where they go. And I was building one recently 
I threw myself into a tailspin because I kept on thinking you know, I'd messed it up. But I was looking at the left and the right. There's a subtle difference between the two. I shall put them side by side and hopefully not prove myself wrong. Um, but you know, your wins and losses. They're heavily decorated. And the other thing that I find really interesting about these polyams is they don't just end at their edges. Um, what I mean by that, if I can do this, is normally you'd expect the polyam to end here. But there's these little bits, flanges, wings that come off. And stop it from going forward. It's a very strange thing. So I'd have thought when you've got your leg bent, it means it can capture just about anything. When I've made them in the past, looking at the position of the rivets, I assume, or I've assumed that it's just a normal crease and um, well, set of lanes underneath the poly. But just with this odd bit in the front there, which would make for a very peculiar looking articulation apart from who stood there. But I suspect, given his social standing, if these were gold plated, in some way they would have looked magnificent. So let's get around the other side because I don't have the sun in my eyes there and we can take a look at his quiz. There we are again, so we're back on the other side. I'll just put that there so I can get a screenshot. Hopefully proving what I was saying about the fancy work. The thing I love about creases, fluting, whatever you want to call it, on English armour is it attempts, I think, to look like drapery. I'll show you what I mean just as we get up onto the tacit. But here's the crease. There's not an awful lot to see of it, to be honest. It's a fairly standard looking um, crease uh, on an effigy. You can see there's a bit of fluting going on there, the central ridge. And you can see the polling there wrapping itself around with those really high tops. And standard decoration there. Now, given that they'd put an awful lot of effort into buckles and straps on this armor, again, there's none here. I'll have to compete with the organ again. There's none on this side, so I suspect um, strapping would have been round the side, or it might even be um, pinned again. A solid structure around the side. I'm doing some sort of tuning or whatever they're doing on the organ at the minute, so rather than compete. With it. I'll just uh, take a seat, have a quick look at him in his finery, quick look around the cathedral. And then I'll just wait for them to finish what they're doing. So move up from the crease, move up the tassets, and you can see here what I'm talking about, about this drapery effect. Very standard set of six or so tassets around, wrapping around the body typical of English harness. So again, I don't think this is a Milanese harness. It's very typical of an English harness. And this look of drapery, like folds as opposed to creases, that you see in these effigies. Now, whether that was artistic to the effigies or whether that was what the armourer was doing, I just don't know. There's no complete English harness left. But wherever I look on this, I see a sort of drapery, particularly when you get up to the top, you start dealing with his pauldrons and so on. So we move off the tassets and we're on to the fouled. I would suggest there's six hoops in that foul. Um, it all depends on what this bit here is doing. But looking at the buckles, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, and then this thing there. But it, to me, it looks like there's six, again, very typical of the English harness. And whether the foul is attached, hard attached, if you like, riveted, with leathers and so on to the base of the plackets and the breastplate, or if it's a separate thing that would be locked on, is a cause of some debate. And I'm not going to answer it looking at this particular effigy. Obviously, you can see there's separate sheets of metal, but we don't know what's going on underneath with the leather and riveting. Now, the breastplate and placket are difficult to see. They look fairly standard of the period, to be fair. Nice scallop, just visible there above the polling. Coming down, you can see a separate piece there on the back plate, and this good-sized buckle attaching it. It's worth saying as well, on some of these buckles and the artwork, you can still see the colors, assuming the medieval colours coming through and it's not 
a later attempt at restoring him. And you can see it all through him. We're going to colour him in a minute. So there isn't a lot to say. Nice central ridge on the breastplate. The arms look like closed cannon van braces. No sign of the hinges on there. I think oh, they might not be closed cannon or they just gave up the chase as they went round the corner there. You can see just, if I can find my finger, just in there, that rolled edge runs out. I imagine that would be difficult to get into. But given the excellent um, workmanship on this effigy, maybe not, I just don't know. A nice bit of fluting on them, nevertheless. And onto the cooter. A standard fix with the two ties and probably a rivet. In there, there he is. Told the strap. Nice big old polyms from the period. But again, if you look at the way that that's folded, it just looks like drapery. Now, whether that was tucked under, you can see here it sort of flows and then goes back underneath, and there's an incised line on the original or whether it was just a good sized almost step flute, we'll never know. The effigy is great at giving us information and they went to great depths sometimes putting on damaged hinges and buckles and so on, but we just don't know whether that drapery was an existent at the time or just an artistic means on the effigy. Very little sign of the rear brace, very little work. You can see his male peeking through there on his asymmetric pony, uh, asymmetric pauldrons. So just before I leave the breastplate and placket, you can see there the massive great hinge and hinges of the fouled, allowing him to be enclosed in his armour. Massive great hinge, wonderful bit of workmanship. And then on to the pauldrons. Now, without getting thrown out for climbing over all of this, I just have to try and make do with my dodgy filming. You can see the large pauldron on this side and the asymmetrically smaller pauldron on this side, so you can get a lance in under his armpit. Again, typical, not unique too, but typical of English harness. And again, that drapery effect. Oh, I've lost this, there we go. That drapery effect that you can see all over this. I think it's wonderful. Rather than just some flutes and so on, creases, it's, it's made to look like material, look like cloth, in my opinion. See the reinforce coming across here, and there's rivets, holding it in. And the care and attention that was taken to making this polling, uh, pauldron actually work, or look as though it could work. It's a wonderful piece of craftsmanship, this effigy. I know you can't rely on effigies for absolutely everything to do with armour, but they're a great resource at informing us what was going on. And then a male mantle of some description. And a typical haircut at the time, which seems to be slowly coming back into fashion, ever so slightly. No gauntlets on him. A couple of rings. Sadly, no gauntlets. So there we go. Robert Lord Hungerford, in all of his glory. And the ramblings of an armourer. He's currently making it. I've probably missed loads out, got bits wrong, but like I say, somewhere in the middle is where we're all aiming for, hopefully. But a fantastic effigy, absolutely worthy of a visit to Salisbury Cathedral to get a good look at. I shall have a chat with the cathedral, see if we can get them put on their maps. I don't think they realise quite where they've got it. And lastly then to finish, a few details on the colour that's left some green flecks one there inside the cord and one there not much in his 
body at all. It's when you get stuck into these bits here. Look. You can see the colour of the straps here was red. Looks like blues there, I guess, and red there. Not quite know what's going on there. You can still see fully chrome detail on a lot of the harness and the magnificent workmanship that was done on these buckle ends. Some great fat buckles as well. Even on the holes for the buckle pin, there's decoration. Absolutely fantastic. A little bit of greenery. Green colour left on his cushions there. And to help us feel safe, you can see it just there as well. Lovely details on the cushions. If you're looking at medieval cushions, I don't think you can do much better than that. Fantastic. So, there we go. Robert Lord Hungerford. Executed towards the end of the Wars of the Roses. And presumably in Salisbury Cathedral. Possibly. I hope you enjoyed that. And I shall continue doing these in the future because they're great as a photo record. You get to hear the ramblings of an armourer as he looks at the effigy.